Hi, my name is Dr. Chet Rehal, Chair of the Division of Cardiovascular Diseases at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Today my guest is Dr. Paul Saraja. Paul is an interventional cardiologist in our cath lab. He directs the interventional training program and is a specialist in the evaluation and management of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Paul, welcome. Thank you very much. Paul, when you're seeing a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy for the first time, what are the top three or four things that you must evaluate? Well, I think it's important to keep in mind that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a relatively common condition. Uh, the prevalence is one in 500 uh, persons. So there are actually over 600,000 people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the country uh, alone. The um, most important aspects when we talk about evaluating hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is to look at several things. Um, symptoms in terms of uh, whether or not they are suffering from the typical symptoms of dyspnea, angina, or syncope. Whether or not there's obstruction present because obstruction is an important decision point in how to treat these symptoms. And then finally, what is the risk of sudden death? Because what the sudden death complication is actually perhaps the most feared complication of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So Paul, how do you decide when something needs to be done, whatever that may be? Well, the most important uh, decision about whether or not a treatment needs to be done is to look at the symptom status and how that's impairing a person's lifestyle. Typically, we say severe symptoms, class three or four, dyspnea or angina, but oftentimes we see patients who have less severe symptoms, but the symptoms are interfering with their occupation or what they want to achieve, uh, usually because they're younger and want to achieve more than they can. Now, what, what about the circumstance where you may have a high gradient, but this patient denies symptoms? Do you ever do stress testing on them, or how do you evaluate that type of patient? That's an excellent question, because as I mentioned, there are many people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the world and actually the vast majority of these people have obstruction. Over two-thirds have obstruction, whether at rest or with provocation. So actually, the majority of patients with Holcomb have obstruction, and many of these patients do not have symptoms. So it's important to keep in mind that when we're evaluating these patients, that it's not the gradient that is the decision point in terms of deciding what to do. It's the presence of symptoms, because the gradient is actually very common in these patients. Okay. So once you've decided that something needs to be done, how do you choose between surgical myectomy on the one hand and alcohol septal ablation on the other hand? So in terms of septal reduction therapy, uh, when we've come to that point where a patient has severe symptoms due to obstruction, the two options we talk about are surgery and alcohol ablation. And I do think it's important to keep in mind that surgery is what we consider to be the gold standard therapy for these patients. It's been around for decades. Uh, the success rate is 90 to 95%. Operative mortality less than 1% when it's performed in experienced centers. And we quote those data uh, to the patients. Alcohol ablation, when we look at the metrics of success uh, with surgery, has a success rate of around 80 to 85% in terms of relief of symptoms with residual gradients less than 10. But the important things to consider about alcohol ablation is that there is a different set of complications, mainly due to pacemaker dependency. And there are some data to suggest that surgery is, in fact, better for younger people with a symptomatic obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So is age the main criteria, or are there other anatomic criteria that lean you one way or the other? It's both, and it's really, it takes a really comprehensive uh, approach to decide uh, which therapy. Uh, age is a consideration. In the latest uh, guidelines, they specifically say that we should avoid alcohol ablation in persons under the age of 21, and it's actually discouraged uh, for people under the age of 40. There are some data to suggest that uh, alcohol ablation is less successful in people who are young, but age is not an absolute contraindication. The other morphological issues are related to how thick the septum is, how high the gradients are, and whether or not the septal artery can be cannulated appropriately for the procedure. Now, to me, it's alcohol septal ablation seems like a relatively simple procedure. You inflate a balloon in the septal and squirt in some alcohol. Mm -hmm. Is this something that all interventionalists ought to be doing or should be doing, or why should it be restricted to, to centers uh, who specialize in this? Well, it's, it, it is a really good question because I think the initial enthusiasm for alcohol ablation was to be able to bring something uh, uh, to a broader population of symptomatic patients because surgical myectomy is not available in many, in many centers uh, around the country or around the world. But it's important to recognize that there are complications that are um, specific to the catheterization procedure but also very specific to 
the alcohol ablation procedure itself. And there clearly is a learning curve. These patients are complex, they're heterogeneous, and the current guidelines do recommend evaluation of these patients in a center that is dedicated to the comprehensive and longitudinal care of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. How do you follow these patients following alcohol septal ablation or myectomy? Are there specific things we need to look for? The most important aspects is symptom improvement. Uh, I think certainly with surgery, it's an expectation that the patients should be symptomatic relief. For alcohol ablation, we typically have them in the hospital for four days after the procedure, and we usually bring them back uh, in about four to six months because it takes about two to three months for that infarct to remodel and lead to the and, and to allow for the ultimate relief of obstruction. So we don't make any decisions about whether or not the procedure has been successful with alcohol ablation until about six months after the procedure. And then typically we follow them annually thereafter. And finally, Paul, which patients should get a prophylactic ICD? That's a really good question. Um, you know, some uh, Experts have advocated or discussed that uh, or proposed that alcohol ablation should be considered a risk factor for sudden death because of the potential for ventricular arrhythmias. That has not made it into the latest algorithms and the latest guidelines. And so right now, the decision about ICD implantation is really based on conventional risk factors besides alcohol ablation. Such as? They include uh, non-sustained VT, present on a halter, uh, massive hypertrophy, uh, the presence of unexplained syncope, and most importantly, a family history of sudden death. Good. Paul, well, do, do we ever use genotyping to, to uh, help guide evaluation and therapeutics in Hokum? Um, that's a very good question. So genotyping in the 1990s uh, was actually proposed as a potential way to help risk stratify uh, patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Unfortunately, it hasn't panned out uh, that way, and that's simply because these patients are so heterogeneous. For any group of malignant mutations, we could also find a group of patients who have a benign outcome. And so the genetic testing is often used for screening and for testing individuals who um, may uh, want to obviate the usual screening pathways. But in terms of deciding therapies and risk, uh, we are not using genetic testing in that regard. Our guest today has been Dr. Paul Saraja from the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Clinic, who in the past few minutes has given us a very nice, succinct overview of the evaluation and management of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I hope you found it useful to you as you see patients with this condition. Paul, thank you very much. Thank you very much.